Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a, another edition of Live with the Hagley Historian. I am Lucas Clawson, historian at Hagley Museum and Library here in Wilmington, Delaware. This live stream is coming to you as part of our Hagley from Home initiative. Since staff and researchers, visitors can't go to Hagley at the moment, we're going to bring Hagley to you through all sorts of programming and things like today's live stream. So happy May 1st, 2020, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well out there and that you're uh, enjoying what hopefully will be a nice sunny day. The sun is starting to come out here in Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, hopefully it'll, it'll be nice for the rest of the day. So thanks for joining me. Today we are going to watch a film. Movie Day. Everyone loves Movie Day. I sure did. I looked forward to it in school various uh, times throughout my life, even in college as well. So our film today is going to be one of the oldest ones in Hagley's collections, the oldest extant DuPont Company film that's in our collections, calling Letting Dynamite Do It. But before we get into the film, I'm going to take a few minutes and give you a little bit of context to explain a little bit of background about what it is that you're going to see and, and tell you a, a little bit about some of the explosives and what's happening and how, how DuPont did what it did. So let me get this queued up for you and give you a little bit of uh, background information here. Our film today is Letting Dynamite Do It, again from 1926, the oldest du extant DuPont company film in Hagley's collections. But before we get into, again, the film, let's uh, take a second and get into a bit here of what is dynamite. So it's helpful to know what dynamite is and how it compares to other explosives that DuPont sold during that period. Uh, that way you can uh, get an idea of what it is that you're going to see while watching this film. Dynamite was invented by Alfred Nobel from uh, Sweden, patented dynamite in 1867. This was a, a long process for him in which he lost a couple of family members in explosions. Started off in Sweden, ended up going to uh, Germany finally to set up his factory, but again patented it in 1867. And so what's it made of? It's, it's pretty simple, really. It is nitroglycerin, which is a mixture of nitri nitric and sulfuric acid and glycerin, stabilized with something like diatomaceous earth, clay, sodium nitrate, wood pulp. Part of what Nobel did was to make the substance nitroglycerin stable. Nitroglycerin in and of itself, in its pure form, is incredibly volatile. You can take a can of it and throw it on the floor and it explodes. So you have to mix it with something to make it where you can, you can handle it, carry it around. So mixing it again with the diatomaceous earth, which is fossilized algae, it's uh, used now as an organic pesticide and for other uses, uh, again the clay, sodium nitrate, other things, it makes it where you can handle it, carry it around, package it. So they would take this mixture, it looks like wet brown sugar, and wrap it up in a paraffin coated uh, cardboard or paper. That way you can, you can actually again carry it around and, and set it off, do stuff with it. So this is in addition to another thing that DuPont started selling in the 19th century, which was nitrocellulose. And this is also known as smokeless powder. To make nitrocellulose, that's a mixture of nitric and sulfuric acid and cotton. And so that's processed in a way so that after a time you can uh, leave the uh, acids mixed with the cotton and after it decomposes a bit you can wash the acids out and uh, make an explosive with it or you can process it a little further, mash it down, chop it up and make nitrocellulose which is smokeless powder. So this is a product line that DuPont worked on at the same time it was making dynamite. But it's not to be confused with dynamite. This is a separate product line altogether. And one more thing to throw in, trinitrotoluol or trinitrotoluene, also known as TNT. This is another bit of DuPont's product line during this time period, and it's made from a mixture of nitric and sulfuric acid and the chemical toluol or toluene, uh, depending on your time period as to, to how you pronounce the chemical, how you worded the chemical. But it's, it's a relatively simple mixture. And this is a way to make explosives stable. So with trinitrotoluene, you can cast it more or less. You can melt it. You, know, you can uh, heat it up to about 175 degrees. It becomes liquid, and you can pour it. So it was pretty handy for uh, military applications like putting in artillery shells or sea mines, depth charges during World War I, 
and later stuff like that. It uh, wasn't as good as dynamite in a commercial application for uh, civilian use because with dynamite it packs more punch, you know, more power for uh, however uh, much you're using as opposed to TNT. But TNT is a lot more stable, and it's uh, gets easily confused with dynamite because, uh, like in Looney Tunes, you see TNT. It's easier to write TNT on things, and it's more easily recognizable than necessarily dynamite would be, especially for popular audiences. Uh, during the 20th century. So don't let the two be confused, TNT and dynamite. They are two separate things. Something to point out to you all is that uh, the one thing that all three, nitrocellulose, TNT, and dynamite have in common is that they use nitric and sulfuric acid. And a lot of it has to do with how it's processed. They're not the same thing, although they use some of the same base ingredients. And uh, this is important in how you make it and how you use it. And another thing to point out is that the explosives, TNT and dynamite, both need concussive force to detonate. So they will burn, and after you get them so hot, especially dynamite, it destabilizes and will explode. But unlike black powder, which you need to burn, it's a completely different way of setting it off. So uh, how you detonate black powder, or how you, how you burn black powder is completely different than how you detonate later explosives. And so this comes into uh, how DuPont and other companies think about how they handle these materials and what they do with them. So again, explosives need that concussive force to detonate. That makes them, again, stable. That way you can carry them around. If you accidentally drop it, you don't have to worry about it exploding in some cases. But that's something to think about whenever you're, you're considering these explosives. So we'll get into DuPont and making and selling dynamite versus high explosives. And this is an important step in the process, too, to, to think about you know, what is a high explosive versus a low explosive and how DuPont got into to doing these products, making these products. It started not with DuPont or even on the East Coast, but with a company called the Giant Powder Company in San Francisco, California in 1868. This company got set up pretty quickly after Nobel made his patents. He immediately started selling them around the world. And so sold it to a fellow named Judson in California and other investors who set up the Giant Powder Company. They initially didn't call dynamite dynamite. They called it Giant Powder. They were afraid that people wouldn't be able to pronounce dynamite or remember the word, but they could remember giant. And part of why it took hold in California as opposed to other places is you have to think about the kind of work that they're doing in California. So you're blowing a lot of heavy rock, a lot of mining, heavy extractive industries. They need something that's got a lot – more oomph than necessarily black powder can give. So whenever Nobel came to the United States, sent his representatives to the United States to market this, it really took the imaginations of people in California. DuPont company executives like Lamont DuPont saw this and again recognized the opportunity. So they saw, saw that it was taking a hold in California. Maybe there's something to this, so let's think about it, let's explore it. What would it take to make it? What would it take to use it? How could, how could we apply this particular type of product toward the sorts of things that we do and in, in how the DuPont company operated? So he wanted to, to get into this. So he sent representatives out west. He himself went west to think about this, see it in action, think about how it could apply, be applied to the DuPont company. And so one of the things to think about, again, is the difference between high explosives and then black or brown powder. High explosives detonate, giving a shattering effect. So this works a lot better for rock. So if you're blowing out granite or uh, doing extractive work in California, it gives it a really hard punch. Whereas with black powder and brown powder, and the difference between black and brown powder is that with the brown powder, you just cook the charcoal till it's brown instead of black, and that slows down the rate of burn. That's a lot better for using in firearms in that period, uh, and this is the 1870s whenever DuPont, it's 1870s and 1880s when DuPont's thinking about this, and this is before smokeless powder came on the market. You know, but it combusts and has more of a heaving effect. So many of DuPont's customers during that time, again, the 1870s, 1880s, were in the coal industry. Whenever you're blowing out coal, you don't want it to shatter because you'll turn it to dust and then it's useless. If you're coal mining, blowing out coal, you want it to heave. So with black and brown powder, it blows it out in large chunks. It doesn't pulverize it like it does with high explosives. So that's one of the things to think about in all this. And it was definitely something on the mind of Henry DuPont, 
who was the president of the DuPont Company from 1850 to 1889. He is the person who oversaw DuPont getting into high explosives, but at first he was pretty skeptical of this. It was a new and unproven technology. Then he saw that it wasn't stable. He most certainly read about all the accidents people had in handling nitroglycerin and nitroglycerin-based explosives and questioned the need for it because most of DuPont's customers were, again, blowing out coal. They weren't trying to shatter granite like they were in California. And to add to that, uh, Lamont DuPont ended up starting his own company called Rapano near Gibbstown, New Jersey, and he himself was killed in a nitroglycerin refining accident in 1884. But Henry DuPont's the one who oversaw getting back into high explosives once the chemistry of it stabilized, once he was proved that people would buy it, and that you could change the combination of how you make it. So instead of being 50% nitroglycerin, they realized they could make it with 40% or 20% and lower how explosive it was and make it safer to handle and easier to handle, but that it wasn't so volatile at that point. So he's, again, the one who oversaw this and got the company into high explosives. Once DuPont committed, they committed in a big way. They created their own sales agents to go out and push this, in addition to directly selling dynamite into the places like local hardware stores. So uh, a lot of the people who were their sales agents, they called blasters, and you could be a grade A blaster or a grade B blaster. And your job was to be someone who would go around and blow up things, but you're also a salesman in, in a sense too. So uh, while you're out there, you're saying, okay, uh, so you've got a job that you need done. I can help you do this. Let me help you imagine what explosives can do for you. Let me set up a test and show you how it works. And then also uh, hire me to do the job. I can do it, and then once I show you how to do it, then I can sell you products, and you can do it too. DuPont set up several product lines. One of them was called the uh, Red Cross Low Freezing Dynamite, and part of the idea of the Red Cross uh, was to sh it was more of a marketing and branding thing. If you looked at a box, you see the Red Cross, and you know it's a DuPont product, kind of like with the uh, DuPont Oval. And many of their blasters had uh, pretty characteristic wagons and later trucks, like the one shown in the, uh, the photograph there, where they have danger high explosives, of course, but DuPont logos all over the place. That way you know what it is they're selling, and you know when the blaster is coming to see you. The grade A blasters, by the way, are people who had, uh, according to DuPont, $200 of capital and more. And part of the reason for that is that farmers were some of the people that they worked for, and because you have to wait for your crops to come in to get payment, you had to make sure that these people had enough working capital to be able to stay in business while they waited for farmers to get payment. Grade B blasters are people that didn't have that much. So that's one of the, uh, the distinctions that you make there. DuPont also committed to making facilities, building facilities, to make dynamite. They were already well-versed in handling explosives, so figuring out how to do it in a safe way for employees and a safe way for customers. They immediately set up places around the country in addition to buying into other dynamite factories, like buying into Giant and buying into other companies that were already out there making it. So uh, this is something that they got into in a big way and started setting up production capacity for it. They also set up uh, places to make the acids that were needed, some of the other materials that are needed, uh, the raw materials that went into making the, uh, the, the dynamite and the other high explosives that they got into. One of the ways that DuPont helped make the sale was in advertising. So they certainly made sure to put advertisements in local magazines, national magazines, newspapers, everywhere they can think of. You've got the uh, blasters who are going around showing you how the stuff works, uh, doing practical demonstrations, blowing up things for you if need be, but then also all the advertisements to explain it as well. So the advertisement on the right reads, why dig your ditches when you can blast them? So it's helping, helping people imagine what they can do with explosives. It's not immediately obvious. I mean, it's a, a, a script without a filmmaker in, in some cases, uh, whenever you're thinking about these new products and getting people to envision how they can use them. And also throwing out this larger-than-life type of advertising copy, like the ad on the left, improve the arteries of trade, a way to help uh, say dynamite is great for building roads. It's a way for getting out there and making the nation um, where you can move goods and services. You can, you can think about this in a big way, that uh, DuPont uh, spared no expense with the advertising, but uh, didn't spare any humility in the advertising either in trying to show you how these products were, were great for the nation. Another way that they helped uh, get out there was to educate the consumer. And these are a couple of my, my favorite images having to do with uh, DuPont 
and explosives. Uh, one on the right is uh, one that you uh, will see around the internet pretty frequently called Farming with Dynamite, a few hits to farmers. And this is not a joke. It actually is a real DuPont Company publication. And the idea with this is that it should be distributed through agricultural extensions and to farmers to show them that they could do things like blow out ditches, remove stumps, that you could uh, mix topsoil with, with uh, some of the subsoils using dynamite. And uh, the, the photograph it left, which is, is pretty interesting, is from the Philadelphia School of Horticulture. And it reads, and what you're seeing there is, is a lady standing near a blast hole. And the uh, caption reads, it appears in the above view that the young woman standing near the blast is being hit in the head with a forked stick, which illustrates the disadvantage of standing so near. That uh, Pretty interesting that DuPont would put this out, but it was a tongue-in-cheek way to show that uh, all sorts of people could do this. A lot of their advertising included women during that time, and the point that they were trying to make is that if you can make it where it's safe enough for a woman to handle, if it's easy enough for a woman to use, then anybody can use it. It is a bit sexist in how they did it, but it was a way that they helped make the point. And part of the idea with this image, showing this woman so near the blast, is to show that you can have someone so close to a blast and it won't kill them, but uh, then also to uh, make sure that you're doing things in a safe way, that DuPont in their advertising copy made sure to hammer that point home, is that you should always think about safety and handling, storing, and dealing with explosives in any way. Part of this advertising copy and these agricultural extension demonstrations was, was to get out and, and demonstrate it. So not only do you have blasters, but you have people that, that go out with the agricultural extensions. And what you're seeing in these three uh, photographs is a before, during, and after of clearing out a stream. Uh, so DuPont would uh, do this, would set it up. This is a stream that was done in Iowa around 1940. So they show you this is a stream that has problems. Think about how long it would take if you get out there and try to hand dig it. Machinery sinks into the muck and mud. Our products are so good that you can use them underwater. You can set these things up. You can blow out ditches. All will be well. This will be a fantastic way to use this stuff. So again, DuPont's advertising this pretty heavily because they know that this is a, a good product to try to put out to their civilian markets. And it's important to emphasize here that dynamite is not a product that they typically marketed to the military because it's something that is stable and easy to use, but for military applications, it, not. It's, it is not. It doesn't hold up well in adverse conditions like TNT would. So getting into the TNT product line, although it's a little more low yield than dynamite, it's a better explosive for the military during that time period because it's easier to handle. You can put it in an artillery shell, you can get it wet, and it, it won't hurt it. With dynamite, you can get it wet, but you need to blow it up pretty soon. You can't let it sit in water like you can with TNT. So DuPont in films. One of the ways that the uh, DuPont company decided to uh, get into films was that they, they saw it as an innovative way to help capture the imagination of their potential audiences, their potential clients and customers, that you can see it without having to actually see it. DuPont started around 1910, coming up with a whole series of films that explained what you can do with dynamite, how you, how you deal with it. Unfortunately, none of those really early films survive. The uh, DuPont magazine, which was the uh, DuPont house organ during that time, uh, during most of the 20th century, also ran stories about these films. That way you could see that these films existed. Think about uh, what you could possibly get to, uh, to, to show in your area and again in the agricultural extension offices. Some of the blasters, the uh, people who demonstrated explosives would also take these films out, set them up in a local theater, show them, and then the next day go do a product demonstration. What you're seeing is a uh, page from the uh, DuPont magazine from 1926, the same year that our film, Letting Dynamite Do It, was put out. And the uh, little piece that you see it right is the description of Letting Dynamite Do It, which I'll uh, take a second and read out to you here. It says, Letting Dynamite Do It is a one real picture illustrating uses of dynamite in various parts of the country, which requires 15 minutes for showing. It brings together views of the use of dynamite in lumbering operations in the northwest, in blasting a mountain on the Mexican border to obtain road ballast, in removing a reef from a Florida harbor, in improving an old swimming hole in a rocky creek, in building roads in the western mountains, and in taking out concrete foundations in the midst of a great plant without so much as breaking a window. 
This film also has a feature of unusual interest in that some scenes showing the use of dynamite for chipping out figures on Stone Mountain in Georgia, where the Great Confederate Memorial is being built. So this was the, uh, the trailer, if you will, the blurb that goes along with the uh, letting dynamite do it film. And the last point I'll make here before we get into showing the film is that uh, DuPont used its advertising, its print copy, to reinforce the message of what's going on in the film and vice versa. So this is a, a, a what you're seeing on screen now is, is also from the 1926 edition of uh, the same 1926 edition as the, uh, the film description. And the article is, is called Explosives in the Lumber Industry. And some of the scenes that you're seeing in these photographs are actually shots from the film itself. So they explain in a little more detail what it is that you're seeing. That way, if you watch this without a blaster or someone present to explain what's going on, you can read some of these articles and get an idea of what it is that you're going to see. And so in the, uh, the right-hand image in the bottom left corner, that is a, a bit that's taken directly from the Letting Dynamite Do It film. So now that I've, I've given you a bit of context in all this and explained some of uh, what DuPont's doing and, and how they're doing it, let's get to the film. So I will show this film and then a few things to uh, throw out to you before uh, that this is something that is has been digitized through Hagley Museum and Library and unfortunately only about half of the film survives so it's going to run about eight minutes. And what we'll do along the way is that I'll pause at a couple of spots and explain a little bit of what's going on and, and give you some context. I'll show it to you um, in part, uh, how you, uh, in, 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 a, in a way of, of how you would have seen it whenever this film might have been shown in 1926. So uh, let's get the film started for you. Letting Dynamite Do It. So remember back to talking about what dynamite is made of. This is to help you understand that. And it shows you a stick of dynamite. So when you get this product from DuPont, this is what it looks like. And this is to remind you that explosives are an important part of American industry, American engineering. But getting to the point of there's other things you can do with dynamite as well. And you can't forget that E.I. DuPont Data Moore and Company is the company that made this film. And on to lumbering in the Northwest. Now the idea of the uh, lumberman climbing into the trees is a pretty important one for these films uh, because of uh, what you're going to see is them blowing the top out of a tree and the idea for that is you can blow the top out and run cables from the top of the tree and use it as, as kind of like a winch or to get leverage to move logs around and climbing up into the top of that tree was, was pretty dangerous and so uh, using explosives to do this work instead of uh, sawing off the top of the tree was a, was a pretty innovative thing to do during that period with dynamite. See the lumberjack there blasting away at the top of the tree. So the perils of the log jam, this is uh, another important use of DuPont explosives during that period because one of the more dangerous things for uh, lumberjacks in the uh, early 20th century, throughout the 20th century, is that whenever they get the logs together, they try to put them in the stream and float them down to where they're going. And whenever you have a log jam, that can be pretty dangerous for you. It also backs up all the logs. You can't get them downstream. 
And the way to get it through before was that you actually send people out to try to push the logs down or use black powder in some way to blow them apart. That uh, using dynamite was a, a way that you could do it a lot more safely than you could do it by actually sending a person out onto the log jam to try to knock everything loose. So this is pretty important too, the hill being converted into railroad ballast. This was uh, part of how to promote using dynamite in industries, you know, so you know about it for construction to build roads, but so you can use it to blow out ballast, which is the rocks that you put underneath uh, railroad tiles and railroad tracks. And so saying that the blast is fired from an electric switch is a pretty uh, important bit of this too, because you don't have to physically light a fuse. You can stand back however far and use an electric switch or a blasting machine, which if you watch the Looney Tunes, they push the handle down and everything blows up. That's what a blasting machine is. You hook it up through a blasting cap to explosives, and that's how you can uh, make them explode. So by flipping a switch, you can have thousands of tons of well-broken rock to use for railroad ballast. Or wherever you need thousands of tons of well-broken rock. Another idea with using dynamite during this period, as you can read concrete foundations in the midst of a great plant, were blasted without so much as breaking a window. The idea of this is to show that you can uh, use dynamite to blow out thousands of tons of rocks, or you can use it for more delicate work. And uh, remember that uh, dynamite comes in different strengths. You have some that have more of a nitroglycerin content than others. The lower nitroglycerin content is what you can use for uh, this more fine and exacting work, and that's how you can get to the point where you can blast out a foundation without breaking a window. And of course, demolition, another big use for dynamite. Think of the labor saved. If you don't have to take many days to blow things or to tear things down, you can just blow them apart. And once you've demolished things, you can just go in and clean them up. It makes it nice and easy. Here's another example of how you can use DuPont explosives for, for much the same purpose. So something to point out in this scene is that you see the uh, fellow there with the stick of dynamite in his left hand, and he's pushing the fuse in with his right hand. He's pushing in the blasting cap. And uh, so back to the idea that you need a concussive force, what these blasting caps do is it's not transmitting fire to the dynamite. It's a small explosion that sets off a bigger explosion. And that's uh, what he's setting up. That's what he's doing here. So look how easy you can turn an old house into road building material. And part of the idea with this scene is to show you how easy it is to deal with dynamite. So you can carry it in these boxes safely and that you can move a lot of it in. But uh, cutting cartridges for loading the deep holes behind the quarry face, part of the idea with this is to show you that uh, you can mix and match and combine with the product. So what you're going to see is them taking 
larger sticks of dynamite that are about the size of, uh, of hoagie sandwiches and cutting them up into pieces and throwing it down into the hole. And the idea is that you can make the charge big or you can make the charge small. So you can have a varying uh, blast, a varying force blast for uh, whatever type of work that you're doing. And that's what you're seeing this fella here do, is he's taking his knife and cutting it up. Remembering that this is just wax paper or wax cardboard covering the substance which has the, uh, the same consistency as, as wet brown sugar. So it's pretty easy to cut this up and use it in that way. And it's so safe to handle, you can just chuck it down the hole like he's doing. And remember the idea of the uh, blasting cap to ensure exploding the shot with the greatest possible violence. It is fired with cordo, a lead tube containing TNT, which explodes at a speed of 18,000 feet per second. So remember back to TNT being used. You can use TNT to set off dynamite. So whenever you're cutting it up into pieces and throwing it down in a hole, you need something that's got enough force that it could set all of it off at once. With dynamite and TNT, the uh, detonation is pretty much instantaneous whenever you have a, char a starting blast, a booster blast enough to get everything rolling. So you can use uh, these, these TNT primers to make this all blow up. You can pack a great big hole full of, of dynamite and it will communicate the blast properly. And with a push of the blasting machine, blammo. And look how easy that was to remove a rock face, all with DuPont Dynamite. Now this scene is a little hard to see. You can uh, see the smoke whenever I start the film up again rolling in the valley there in the distance, and that's the, uh, the mountain road that they're talking about. You've got to look closely to, uh, to see where the explosion is going on. And again, after dynamite does the work, the steam shovel has no difficulty. See how easy it is moving all that finely blasted rock out of the way when you use DuPont Red Cross Dynamite. It's also a lot of fun to see the uh, technologies in use here too, like these old steam shovels and uh, some of the other heavy equipment that they're using to move the rock out of the way. So that's uh, something to pay attention to as you watch this and some of the other DuPont films from that era. Now, DuPont's being involved with creating the uh, sculptures at Stone Mountain, Georgia, was a big deal to the company. They put out a lot of advertising copy about this to uh, show some of the fine work that you can do with dynamite. That uh, We've already seen ways that you can blow off rock faces, do more fine work, like take out pieces of a, uh, of a foundation without blasting a window. But uh, one of the ways that uh, DuPont tried to help potential customers imagine what you can do with dynamite is to show that you could do sculpting, that you're not going to do the fine sculpting, but you use this to do the rough end work, that uh, similar processes were later used with Mount Rushmore and other large carvings. This is the idea. After the figures are outlined, dynamite skillfully used, chips away the stone and hews out the figures in the rough ready for the sculptor's chisel. So this is again the way to do the rough end work using dynamite to save the sculptor a lot of time and that way you can do these massive monumental sculptures in granite on the side of a mountain. using these low percentage charges, that's how you can do that. Now 
Now this is a pretty interesting vignette to uh, show how you can demolish something like this underwater. Notice the case of dynamite being lowered down here. But then also the diver himself. This is a pretty interesting thing to show. And, and the idea with the uh, gelatin dynamite is that it's uh, got more nitroglycerin, less of the stabilizing compound. So you have to be a lot more careful to use it, but it makes it a little more impervious to water. That way you can take it completely underwater and set it off. So you can have divers, like you're going to see here, carry cases of this dynamite underwater and set this thing off for uh, underwater demolition work. That uh, DuPont threw that out there quite a bit too and uh, clearing out uh, all sorts of hazards to navigation and major waterways, use it for dredging operations and other sorts of stuff where you need to blow up things underwater. And there's blast number one. And blast number two, which completely takes this thing away. So remember, DuPont isn't shy in touting what they think dynamite can do to the world. And let me read this out for you. Dynamite is an industrial explosive. Its development has placed in the hands of man a great force through which he is able to mine coal, metals, and salt in enormous quantities. So they're showing you what all you can do, how much material you can move using DuPont Dynamite. You know, that this is a, a major labor-saving and game-changing thing for heavy industry. And don't forget the importance of explosives, machinery of all kinds, the metal objects in our homes, building materials, and the means of transportation and communication depend upon explosives. Top that for advertising copy. And unfortunately, this is all of the film. So we have uh, made it to the end. Remember that this was uh, in initially a 15-minute film, and all we've got is uh, about eight minutes, so we've only got about half of it. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching this and hearing a little bit of context about what all of it means. So we'll take a second, and uh, if you've got any questions, fire them away. I'll be happy to uh, talk about this uh, a little more with you if you like and uh, some of the ways that DuPont marketed and sold explosives during the early 20th century. So while we wait to see if any questions come in, let me take a second to uh, point you to our website www.hagley.org. That uh, way you can uh, keep up with what we're doing and this will give you access to other resources that are available at Hagley. If you want to learn more about Dynamite and see this film or other films, which are in our collections, go to our digital archives at digital.hagley.org. You can uh, do keyword searching there. We've also got discrete film collections. You can go in and use some of the drop-down menus, like uh, the list of all digital collections, and you can find some of the films that we have there. And there it's pretty interesting stuff that there's a lot of DuPont films, but some specifically with explosives. And also... Another interesting resource, which I hope you all will take a look at, is called the Brandywine Valley Oral History Project. This includes oral histories of people who lived around the uh, powder yards here in Wilmington, Delaware, but also people who worked for DuPont. So there are a lot of people who ended up uh, getting into the dynamite, into the business, and talking about making, selling high explosives during the late 19th, early 20th century. You can get to this through our website, hagley.org, or you can get to it through some of the individual oral history interviews through our digital archives. So uh, please be sure to, to check them out there. 
Also, uh, keep up with our Facebook page, Hagley Museum and Library. You can see uh, what else we've all what all else we've all got going on. Uh, go to our um, films there to see some of the films that we've been putting out. In addition to uh, notices for live streams and other things. We've got a question here from Peter. Do we know how many of these films have been lost? I do not know. Uh, one of the things that uh, I need to try to figure out, and then I, I frankly don't know, is how many films in total DuPont created during that time period. That there are uh, quite a few that were made before this one. Again, this is the oldest one in our collections. There were quite a few that are made afterward. Uh, some of the uh, films were lost or deliberately destroyed because they were on the nitrate film stock because that itself was explosive. A lot of them were destroyed. You can uh, see what we have in our digital archives. We've got more that we haven't yet digitized that uh, we're going to try to get up before long, too. But there are other ones through uh, the Library of Congress and I think through the National Archives that are uh, DuPont-related that you can uh, see uh, that are out there. But again, to your question, I, I do not know how many of these films have been lost over time. Any other questions about this film or DuPont explosives during that time period? Well, if you think of any, you can uh, go to our website, hagley.org. You can uh, use our standard form, askhagley at hagley.org, which you can find through our website. You can also find it through our digital archives to send in questions. Or you can reach out through Hagley's Facebook page or my Facebook page, Lucas R. Clawson, Hagley Historian, to ask other questions, find out more. Or you can uh, put comments in uh, or ask questions through the comments section of this event page. So thank you all for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed Movie Day. I'll dig in and find some other fun and unique films, and we'll, we'll do this again sometime. So uh, tune back in next week to Live with the Hagley Historian. We'll be back with you next Friday, 10 to 11 a.m. for more information, scholarship, things about collections at Hagley Museum and Library. Thank you all for tuning in. Everyone stay safe out there, and we will see you next week.